Hello everybody, Ben Starr here, and today is the royal wedding, and everybody in this country seems to be obsessed with what is going on across the pond. So today I have decided to make only British foods for you, and we are making that classic that is famous the world over, fish and chips. So the first thing we need to concentrate on is the batter for our fish. It has to be light, crispy, flavorful, and delicious. So in my bowl here, I have one and a half cups of regular all-purpose flour. And to that, I'm going to add half a cup of cornstarch. Now, cornstarch is incredible in any type of battering situation because it makes your batter really light, crispy, and fluffy. Now, we need some seasoning so that our batter is not bland. So I'm going to add about a teaspoon or a teaspoon and a half of garlic powder. I'm going to add some, probably about the same amount of onion powder. And I need some cayenne pepper. Let's see if I can find some here in my cabinet. Ah, there it is. Just a little bit, not too much because the British people don't really like hot and spicy food. So we're going to add maybe a quarter of a teaspoon full of cayenne pepper. Now, I'm going to whisk that together with my hands. Add maybe about a teaspoon of salt, kosher salt. And our liquid for the batter is beer, a nice dark brown beer. Now this is my homemade pumpkin ale. And I assume that most of you are laboring under the situation where you don't really have a supply of Ben's homebrewed pumpkin ale at your house. If this is the case, you can use any type of dark English brown ale like Newcastle. That's fine. Of course, Ben's homemade pumpkin ale is going to taste better, but if you can't find it in a pinch, you can use Newcastle. A bottle's worth 12 fluid ounces or one and a half cups. So we're going to add this to our dry ingredients. It's going to foam, of course. Now we're going to whisk it until it's smooth. And once our batter is smooth, we're going to put it in the fridge and we're just going to let it sit there for an hour because the batter needs to hydrate in order to fry up nice and crisp and light. Okay, I forget that most of you are going to watch this video years after the royal wedding and you're going to wonder what the heck is on top of my head. A decree was sent out with all invitations to the royal wedding that all women and encouraged for men that they must wear hats. My wonderful neighbor Sharon, who you're about to see when we finish making the fish and chips, made this wonderful hat which she calls the Fascinator to wear while she watched the royal wedding. And she was insistent that I wear it while I cook today to make sure that all of the food I prepare is authentic. So thus, the Fascinator. Okay, now it's time to make the chips portion of the fish and chips. British people call French fries chips. I don't know why, we'll forgive them for that. Okay, now the best way to make french fries is to make sure that each slice of french fry is perfectly even. And really, the only way to do that is with a mandolin or a V-slicer. Now if you don't have one of these, you should probably get one. They're only about 20 or 30 bucks for a decent sized one that'll cut pretty well. Uh, but if you just absolutely refuse to get yourself a mandolin, you can cut it individually on a cutting board. It's just gonna take longer. And err on the side of making sure every slice is symmetrical and precise like the previous slice. Even thickness will give you even cooking on your french fries or your chips. Okay, so this is how you operate a mandolin. Do not ever use your mandolin without the handy guard that prevents you from slicing your hand in half. Um, because if you don't use this guard, you will slice your hand in half. All right, so you take your whole potato that's been fully washed, you put it down in your mandolin with the medium or wide sized slicing blades, and you move down, like so. And this is actually cutting our potato into perfect French fries, look at that. Each one of them is evenly cut. And you plop these into... That's a lot of freaking French fries. Do you see how many French fries this one... I haven't even used the whole potato. Do you see how many French fries this whole potato is going to make? Like, if you were at McDonald's, this would be like a large-sized fry. Out of like a five-cent potato, and McDonald's charges you, what, $2 for a large fry? 
Now you know why fast food companies make so much freaking money. Because one potato makes like an infinite number of fries. Okay, anyway, you're going to dump your fries into a bucket of cold water. Not really a bucket, a bowl. And there are several reasons for this. First of all, if you cut a potato and leave the cut side open to the air, it oxidizes and turns brown, which is disgusting. Uh, second of all, you want to wash off the outside layer of starch on each individual fry because if you try to fry them with all starch on the outside, they're going to turn gummy and gross. You want them light and crisp, so you need to wash off the outside starch from the surface area of the fry and your uh, bucket of cold water will do just that. Okay, so you're going to keep these in here and then when it's time to fry, we're going to take them out, dry them off, and plop them into the hot oil. Do not adjust your screen. We have switched kitchens. Okay, so we're in my neighbor Sharon's kitchen right now and it's time to deep fry our fish and chips. And no, there is no way around deep frying when it comes to fish and chips. You have to deep fry. You might get away with pan frying with about that much oil, but you really need to deep fry in a gallon of some type of oil that has a really high smoke point like canola oil or peanut oil. And today we're going to use canola oil. And I have a regular stash of canola oil that I use to regularly deep fry things like turkeys and fish and chips. And when I'm done, I strain it off. And once it's cool, I put it back in the container and we continue using it. Now, our potatoes have been soaking in ice cold water. I've drained them off, but before we can add them to hot oil, we have to dry them. So, we're going to take some of the potatoes, scatter them out on a dish towel, spread them out into like one layer-ish, cover them, and pat them dry. If you try to drop wet potatoes into your boiling oil, you will set your kitchen on fire. So don't do that. I know this because I've done it before, multiple times. So dry off your potatoes before you cook them. Stick them up! In the spirit of my ancestor Bell Star, I have purchased a infrared thermometer that you can point to anything and discover its temperature. I got this from Alton Brown. I'm not really that original, but it's a great piece of equipment. It costs anywhere from 50 to 100 bucks, and I know that's a ton of money. And I thought, oh, it's just going to be a luxury, but I've discovered that I actually use it all the time in the kitchen. So if you cook a lot, get yourself one of these on the internet. Sometimes you can get them as low as 45 or 50 bucks for a decent one. I am actually taking the temperature of my oil right now, and it is 365 degrees. Now, the secret to crispy french fries is a double fry. Your first fry is around 325 degrees. That's called a blanch. We're going to dip the fries in there until they're limp. We're going to take them out, then we're going to raise the oil to 375 degrees and put them into the fryer because that is going to make them nice and crisp on the outside. So, my oil is too hot at the moment to do my first blanch at 320 degrees, so I've turned off the heat and I've moved it off the burner. I'm going to let it cool to 325 degrees. As soon as we hit that mark, we're going to do our first fry. Okay, so my oil is at 320 degrees. We're going to do our first fry, which is actually called a blanche. Now, don't throw a huge amount of fries into hot oil because the oil is going to foam. So scatter them in gently. You'll see some foam start to come up. You don't want that to overflow. If it overflows, you're going to set your kitchen on fire. And I can tell you firsthand, having set my kitchen on fire many times, that you don't want to set your kitchen on fire. Okay, so very carefully add them. Okay, so after a couple of minutes or so, your fries in the 320 degree oil are kind of limp. See that? We're going to take them out and let them cool completely to room temperature before we do our second fry. And if you're making a lot, it's now time to put in your second batch. Okay, so now it is time to prepare our fish for the fish and chips. 
Uh, you want to use a whitefish. Cod is traditional. You can use tilapia in a pinch, but uh, cod is much thicker and it'll give you the, that bite that you're looking for for fish and chips. And cut them into like three by one inch slices like that. All right? Now we are going to put them in a Ziploc bag filled with corn starch or tapioca starch or whatever starch you just happen to have laying around. You can use flour in a pinch, but again, to get that nice big crunch, you really want to use cornstarch. Put them in this bag. Then we're going to seal the bag almost closed. Now we're going to inflate the bag and shake it like crazy. It's shaking, Megan. I helped. Okay. Now we're going to hold our starch is perfectly covered on the fish. We're going to dip it into the batter and fry it once we're done with the chips. But the chips are ready for their second fry. Now let's talk about our draining for just a second. Obviously we're deep frying and when these things come out of the fryer they're going to have excess oil on them. So what we've done is we have a regular cooling rack here upside down on top of paper towels. And what this does is it prevents the, you don't just want to put your fried stuff on top of paper towels because then it's going to stick and sit in its grease and the grease is going to go back into the breading. But then you don't want to just set them on top of a cooling rack suspended over the ground because then the oil isn't going to be wicked away from the food and it's going to stay in the breading. So what you do is you turn your cooling rack upside down so the cooling rack is in contact with the paper towels. The paper towels will wick the grease away from the breading, but the tiny thickness of the wire is going to prevent that grease from coming back into the breading at the end. So you're going to have a beautiful, crisp breading that's not coated and soaked in grease. All right, my oil is at 375 degrees, so now it's time for the second fry. Now don't overwhelm your fryer, otherwise the oil is going to explode and go everywhere. Your kitchen is going to catch on fire and the fire department's going to come. And that's not what you want to do to your neighbor's kitchen on the eve of the royal wedding. So watch very carefully. Now when your fries are nice and crisp, it's time to take them out. And this is the time to salt them while they're still damp from the fryer. Now, you've got to let your oil return back to 375 degrees before you put your next batch in. Now, once you finish cooking all your fries, you can hold them in a 200 degree oven for a few minutes while you cook your fish. So now it's time to make our fish. So you take your fish out of the starch wash, or like so, and you plop it into our batter that's been prepared, our beer batter that's really good that's been soaking. Make sure you shake off any excess starch and then just dump it into the batter. The next step is not going to be pretty. You've just got to get your fish covered in that icky, disgusting, but delicious beer batter. And once your oil is at 350 degrees, perfect. You slip your fish right into it. Now there's really no way to avoid this nasty disgustingness. You're just going to have to get used to it. Wash it off each time you're finished putting a batch of fish into the fryer and then start all over again. I'm gonna be honest with you, the fascinator was not really working for me. 
The instant it started to make a mad dash for the boiling oil, I decided I had to get rid of it. Sometimes kitchen safety takes precedence over fashion. Now, when your fish has been in there for about three minutes and is nice and brown, we are going to remove it to our draining rack and salt it while it's still moist. Now just repeat until all your batches of fish have been perfectly fried. And once you're done, you're gonna have a plate of delicious, crispy, perfectly seasoned fish and chips that even the queen would like to eat after her son, grandson, right, got married. I'm Ben Starr. Check out my website, benstar.com, for more recipes, photographs, and travelogues from my travels all across the world in all seven continents. Thanks, and have a great day.